It was June 1941. Our 41st Motorized Rifle Regiment of the 84th Division of the 11th Army was in camp at that time. We were located on the bank of a small rivulet, a tributary of the Vilja River. The tents of the regimental school, in which I was a cadet, were set up near the location of the companies of the 2nd Battalion. It was not by chance, as it was announced to us even before leaving for the camp, during regimental exercises and in case of battle, the school should act with the 2nd Battalion as an independent unit. But the main task of the school was to train junior commanders. Therefore, the combat training program was more extensive than in other units, and the requirements for cadets were much higher than for battalion men. We were enrolled as cadets after two months of service in regular companies. The school selected tall, physically developed guys with education of six, seven grades and above, who for a short period of service managed to show themselves positively. For those years, six, seven grades of secondary school was considered a high educational level. There were fighters who could hardly write and read. We, educated, had to compose letters to their relatives and loved ones at their request. Assistant platoon commanders and squad leaders of the school were mostly picked up from those who had had a chance to sniff the powder in the Finnish campaign, from the super conscripts. Our assistant platoon commander was Senior Sergeant Brodolf. He's a teacher by civilian specialty. Probably, it helped him to conduct classes clearly, intelligibly, to find an approach to everyone, although we were all different. Brodov's authority was so unquestionable that no one could lie to him, and in case of mental troubles we turned not to anyone, but to the senior sergeant for advice. He strictly demanded from his subordinates, treated everyone equally, and at the same time did not humiliate anyone and did not allow anyone to laugh at his comrades. Lieutenant Roshkov, the commander of the platoon, assigned Brodov to lead all formation classes and classes on the study of weapon parts, and we understood why. The lieutenant, as we learned, was the son of a major military officer and was preparing to enter a military academy. Besides, he understood perfectly well that he could not equal the senior sergeant in knowledge and ability to lead classes. Brodov was tall, broad-shouldered, athletic in build, and always maintained a perfect military bearing. A deep scar on his right cheek from a bullet of a white Finnish sniper did not disfigure his face, but gave him a stern and noble look. We looked at our commander with admiration when he demonstrated bayonet fighting techniques. It seemed that there was no man who could overpower Brodov in bayonet combat. In his hands, three rifle flashed like a toy. In formation training, he was also no equal. We were especially impressed by the clarity and precision of his movements when Brodov took the rifle on the arm and walked in formation, raising his foot with the toe pulled back to a height of 45 centimetres without bending his knee, as was required by the regulations, he clearly chased his step. At the sight of this we imagined how our soldiers marched on the Red Square at the festive parades. Brodor for us, then was as if descended from the movie footage of those years. During the study of weapons, the senior sergeant deftly disassembled and assembled a rifle, automatic rifle and machine gun. His movements were brought to automaticity. After each operation, Brodov paused for a second so that the cadets could better memorize them. Once he demonstrated assembling and disassembling a rifle blindfolded. We timed it and tried to repeat his speed without being blindfolded. But, alas, no one managed to even come close to the time it took our commander to assemble and disassemble the weapon. Brodov explained that there was nothing special about it. It is necessary to put each part in a certain order when disassembling, and the rest depends on training and effort days in the camp were spent in intense combat training. Besides Mosin rifle, we studied PT automatic rifle and Simonov semi-automatic rifle. The new weapon, which we first saw in a newsreel showing the parade in Moscow, was not very popular with the old military. Those who had been to the Finnish complained about the PPD. They were especially dissatisfied with the disc spring, made of thin wire. It was weak and often broke in places affected by rust, which caused many failures. The semi-automatic rifle was also capricious. It was mainly used as a sniper rifle. Brodov knew this weapon very well. Once he even showed how to shoot in bursts from a semi-automatic rifle by pinching the whisper with a match. But he did not recommend to use this method, as there were only ten cartridges in the disc of the rifle, and besides it could cause different delays. Throws on alarm were constantly practiced in the camp. At first, many cadets could not withstand the pace set by the regimental school commander Major Sidorenko. 
We knew that he was a cadre military man who had served in the engineering forces for a long time. He was awarded the Medal XX Years of the Workers and Peasants Red Army. Sidorenko was about 40 years old, small in stature with a paunch, the kindest expression on his face. He outwardly looked more like an intendant than a line commander, but in foot rushes he walked, as the cadets put it, like a moose. Long-legged and thin Lieutenant Rushkov could hardly keep up with him, and Sidorenko in every couple of kilometres of the way stopped and pushed the stragglers. Mmm, pull up, pull up, do not lag behind, do not lag behind, he hurried the cadets with a ringing voice. Then he caught up with the head of the column and again increased the pace. Throws usually ended with the occupation of the defence or the initial boundary for the offensive. This is where Sidorenko squeezed seven sweats out of us. He gave the command to take the line and digging, and himself timed it. Those who chose the wrong place for a trench or wanted to cheat, i.e. to make the trench shallower or narrower, got it. The commander of the training company determined the size of the trench by eye, but always had a tape measure with him. It served him to prove to the cadet that he was mistaken. When someone tried to justify that he did not have such a tape measure, the major said that the fighter always has a lot of means to determine the dimensions with the smallest tolerance. It is necessary to know the length of a small sapper shovel, the lengths of a cartridge, bayonet, the trace of one's shoes. Then you can mark everything without a tape measure. Resourcefulness, soldier's resourcefulness is needed, Amy said the major. Those who chose the wrong boundary were the ones who got hurt the most. I remember once I was making a trench in full height. Sidorenko passed by silently several times and said nothing. I did my... I made the trench with love, according to all the rules, measuring its dimensions. When I finished everything and covered the bumper with sod, the major was near me again and asked me... Hmm, Sadeta Vakumov, how long do you intend to hold out in this trench? Hmm, I will hold the defence until I run out of ammunition, and then fight back with bayonet. You won't have to fight back with your bayonet. The enemy will destroy you in the first minutes of the battle. He pointed to a ravine, which was twenty metres away from the trench. The enemy will crawl up this ravine unnoticed and destroy you with a grenade, explained the Major. He detailed the disadvantageous location of my trench, pointed out that the sector of fire from it is very narrow and communication with my comrades in the squad is not ideal either, and immediately ordered me to find a suitable place for the trench and dig it out again. I had to work hard. But the lesson I learned from Sidorenko I remembered thoroughly. Lord in training, easy in battle, constantly reminded us Sidorenko, for which we nicknamed him Suvorov, and for his appearance was also called Kolobok. But we all respected our commander. He was simple, responsive, attentive to his subordinate. One cadet received a letter informing him that his father was ill, and the house where the family lived required serious repairs. The guy was not himself, did not share his grief with anyone. This was noticed by the Major, in conversation managed to call the cadet to Frank. The guy showed the letter. The Major asked the cadet to write a report on leave. Although the vacation was not entitled, Sidorenko managed to convince the regiment commander to let the cadet go home for fifteen days. This time was enough to repair the house. The Major loved songs and was a good singer himself. He sang songs for the platoon, picked them up personally and listened to them. Each platoon had its own favourite song and the company had its own. On the evening walk we always sang. Our school, the school of commanders, the junior command staff of the regiment. Three whistlers accompanied the refrain with a dashing whistle. The regiment commander more than once announced the company's gratitude for a good song. When tired units returned from regimental exercises, the regimental commander in his MK drove up to our company and, turning to Sidorenko, said, Cheer up, Major, the soldiers. Let your young men a good formation to tear off. And Sidorenko seemed to be waiting for it. Together with the singer Sergeant Fedorov, he began, Unharness your horses, boys, for another dashing song. Even before leaving for the camp, being in the military town, we heard a lot about the fact that the war was about to begin. The wives of many commanders were leaving for the interior of the country to their relatives. More and more often we began to talk about border violations and other provocations on the part of Nazi Germany. Although political workers and commanders convinced us otherwise, but it was felt that they thought the same as we did. Vague anxiety and bad premonitions did not leave us. 
And then there was Sergeant Fedorov, who could not help singing, and lately he was more often singing sad songs. But it did not prevent him from dreaming. He so colourfully described to us how soon he would return home, meet his father, mother, his beloved girl, and how they would live after the wedding. We listened and envied him. Staff Sergeant Brodov often began to say that he was tired of the service and missed his teaching. Hey, my boys will be graduating from the tenth grade now. They have grown up, matured, I probably won't recognise them, he said dreamily, with deep sadness. Once, already in the camp, during self-training Sergeant Fedorov, took an accordion and instead of his favourite Katyusha, pulled a song from the movie Big Life about how a young conicon carried with a broken head. He sang with some soulful tear, heartfelt, blowing out a tear. Major Sidorenko, who in the camp was almost irremovably in the company, came up behind Fedorov, put his hand on his shoulder and said, Enough, my friend, I can't take it any more. Start a cheerful one. Tears came to the commander's eyes. Seeing this, Fedorov immediately tore the bellows and began. You said, Monday? Everyone picked up the song. They sang it dashingly. But something sad, inexplicable remained from this picture on the soul of me and I think, of others. Then came the duty officer, brought the mail and, as usual, made the happy people dance, who brought news from relatives, loved ones and friends. I also received a letter. It was written by my brother, Ivan. Hello, Kolya. A fiery greeting to you from the whole family. We live no worse than when you were here. I'm finishing seventh grade. I'll pass my exams. I'm sure of it. I haven't decided what I'll do next. If my parents are healthy, maybe I'll go to the eighth grade. But if not, I'll go to a trade school or work. My father's health is not good. It's time to retire. But he's still chortling, saying that he'll bring me to the institute, make me an engineer with a higher education. Of course, it's not a bad thing to study, but you have to have a conscience. The old man had a hard life, you know, and we can study by correspondence if necessary. I keep thinking, what should I be? If I could become a chauffeur, I'd go without a second thought. We often talk that there might be a war. Is it true? My father told me that they took the best horses from the construction yard. They say it's for the army. Supplies got worse, too. Butter was sold intermittently. They give only 200 grams per hand. But everything seems to be in stock. With whom can there be war with the Japanese? Didn't Kalkin Gold work out well? With the Finns again? It doesn't look like it. There's often talk that Germany is saving up its strength for us. You're serving over there near the border. You probably know best what's going on. We planted a lot of potatoes this year. In addition to our own vegetable garden, we cut the virgin land under the high-voltage station and planted 300 acres there. My father said that it wouldn't hurt us just in case. But when there's a war, it's always hungry. When you come on vacation, we'll talk enough. Until then, goodbye. I'm waiting for an answer like the nightingale of summer. Your brother Ivan. The letter, which I had hoped would dispel the bad mood, on the contrary, confirmed in me the idea that there would still be a war, if they talk about it even in the Urals. Lately we have been urged to be vigilant, more and more often, lectured that we must be in constant combat readiness. But no one gave us an answer to those who doubted whether there would or would not be a war. Even Staff Sergeant Bradov, who was well versed in the international situation and answered any questions, evaded answering this one. And once, when he was asked once again, he said that senior political officer Smirnov would give a lecture on this topic. Such a lecture soon took place. Senior political officer Smarnov opened the newspaper for June 14 and read us the task statement. It refuted rumours about the inevitability of war between the USSR and Germany. I can't tell you more. And now I'm hurrying to the headquarters. Smirnov evaded questions. By the behaviour of the senior political officer was evident that he does not doubt that refuted in the statement, but to say what he thinks does not want to. On June 18, classes were interrupted and an alarm was announced. Petty officer Yanovsky commanded company to arms. Platoon commanders reported to Major Sidorenko about the presence of soldiers in the ranks, and then the company was assigned a task. Regimental school must march to the location of the military camp. Do not remove the tents in the camp. Carry only the essential. We made the crossing in two hours and a bit. In the town, all equipment was put on alert. We were ordered to burn all notes and manuals. We were given ammunition. In the afternoon, all units of the regiment built near the vehicles on which to go. We were announced that the army exercises with live firing would start the other day, and we should go to the field for training. 
Toward evening, the regiment left and after two or three hours stopped in a pine forest that bordered the bread fields. Immediately, we were ordered to dig trenches for shelter from aircraft. And hot days of training began, constant marching on foot, digging trenches. Everything that we used to go through theoretically, now we practiced in practice. We worked 10, 12 hours a day. Our commanders were almost always in the units and slept with us on the ground. On the ground, having under themselves the lower branches of trees, we were not allowed to cut down the upper branches, which were softer than the lower ones, but kept them for camouflage purposes. In addition to the usual posts around the place where the regiment was stationed, there was a constant patrolling. There was a rumour that a group of saboteurs disguised in Red Army uniforms had broken the telephone communication of the district neighbouring Vilnius by knocking down several poles. We were not allowed to go beyond the edge of the forest. In the night from June 21 to June 22, in our company was held a game of night search. By dawn we all, soaked through, returned from the exercise. All were cheerful. Impressions a lot, topics for arguments and discussions are plenty. We were forbidden to light fires, but to warm up faster, we were allowed to rest in the open on the southeastern slope of the hill, behind the forest. The petty officer announced that in connection with night classes, the company would be raised two hours later, and Sunday, June 22, was declared a working day. We had no sooner fallen asleep when muffled explosions came from the direction of Kaunas and merged into a single rumble. Well, that's the beginning of the army exercises with live firing. Sergeant Fedorov commented listening to the explosions. But the tired guys were more interested in sleep, so not everyone paid attention to the explosions. The morning of June 22 began with a polit information. Senior Sergeant Brodov retold materials from the central newspapers about the most important events in the life of the country. At that time, several airplanes flew over the forest almost at a strafing flight. Since the trees hid the sky from us, we could not see what kind of airplanes they were. Having finished the polit information, Brodov announced a break for ten minutes, but it dragged on for almost half an hour, because the next class, according to the announced schedule, was to be conducted by Major Sidorenko but he was somewhere absent. We went out of the forest to the edge of the forest to escape the heat, although the sun was blazing here, but the breeze brought coolness, and the air was drier and fresher. Suddenly, from the direction where the airplanes had gone, we heard the rumble of engines. We saw our fighter flying low over the ground. From the wings and cockpit popped out tongues of fire, and behind the tail stretched a black plume. It was pursued by two airplanes with crosses on their wings. After a few seconds, the planes disappeared behind the forest, and then there was an explosion. We realized how it all ended. The explosions from corners continued to grow stronger and weaker. We surrounded Brodov and bombarded him with questions. He answered that it looked like a war, but we would know for sure soon. All unit commanders were summoned by the regimental commander, and we smoked and everyone expressed their conjectures. Some said it must be a provocation. Others said that it was a real military conflict, which could end in war. But most of them thought that what they feared war had begun. The conversation was interrupted by Lieutenant Roshkov. He came running and excited. We'd never seen him like this before. He organized the platoon and commander. Run after me march. We ran out into the clearing, where some of the regiment's units were already lined up. When everyone had gathered, the rally began. Senior political officer Neustrayev opened it. He said that Hitler's Germany treacherously attacked the Soviet Union. Now there are fierce battles along the entire length of the border from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. The enemy has managed in a number of directions to cross the border and cut into our territory. Our division will have to meet the enemy and give him a worthy response. He said that Comrade Molotov had just made a speech. The senior political officer concluded his speech with the words, Our cause is right. The enemy will be defeated. Victory will be for us. Speakers at the rally angrily branded the enemy, vowed to destroy him. It was announced that our special Baltic military district was renamed the Baltic Front. By evening the regiment left this place and moved on, towards Kaunas. We drove slowly, looping. As darkness fell, the pace of the regiment's advance slowed down. Chauffeurs, who did not know how to drive in the dark, often drove into ditches, cars collapsed. Therefore we had to stop a lot and stand for a long time. Finally the regiment arrived at the appointed place. Here were already standing dug into the ground near the road anti-tank guns. It was obvious that the artillerymen had arrived long before us and had time to prepare for battle.
Taking up our defences, we were ordered to entrench. Most of us were worried that the ammunition received in the town would not be enough for a good fight. Unit commanders reassured us that by morning the regiment would be fully supplied with everything necessary. Major Sidorenko read the order on awarding the rank of sergeant to graduates of the school, and said that tomorrow some of the graduates will be sent to other units as squad leaders and assistant platoon commanders. The remaining graduates of the school will fight as a separate company in the 2nd Battalion, and at the same time serve as a reserve for replenishment by junior commanders of other units. The petty officer handed out to us insignia, metal triangles covered with red enamel. I was given the rank of sergeant by regimental order. Usually graduation from the regimental school used to be, as our commanders told us, solemn like a holiday. With us it was held as if in between. It was the first graduation from the regimental school during the war. The graduation of sergeants who would have to take the first blows of the enemy. What were we then as soldiers? We were convinced that our army was invincible. Successes in the creation of industrial giants of the first five-year period. The Chelyuskin epic, the heroic flights of Chakalov and other pilots, the Stakhanov movement fostered in us, the confidence that we can do everything, there are no obstacles for us. All the political work of that time generated in us a thirst for a feat. I well remember meetings with participants of the battles on Kazan and Kalkin Gol, which were held at school. We watched with interest the film's fighters, Suvorov Shahs, on the and others, glorifying the feats of war, fostering patriotism and faith in invincibility. In the schools of that time, and among the working youth, was developed a craving for sports, work in defence circles. We proudly wore G2 badges for a Shalovsky shooter, PVC Oko. Girls passed for G2 badges. All schools had defence and sports clubs. Of course, then there were no such stadiums as now, courts, swimming pools. But mass sports were in high esteem. I remember we built sports grounds and soccer fields ourselves. We collected scrap metal and other recyclables to buy a soccer ball camera. In those days it was a big deficit. Any call then was a signal to action. So after the call youth to airplanes, almost the whole class went to the Osovayakim Aero Club, but only a few lucky people managed to sign up, and that in the parachute circle. Patriotism, the desire for exploits, were encouraged in songs, in literature, and in mass events. In the middle of 30th years, our fellow countryman from Kushva Border Guard Baranov was captured by Japanese. He fought off the enemies to the last. Only wounded, unconscious, he managed to drag him across the border. The Japanese brutally mocked the hero and tortured him to death. All regional and local newspapers described Baranov's feat. It was told about him at school rulings. Soon there was a song about the heroic feat of a border guard. And what song sounded then? Take at least the most popular Katyusha, Kakovka. I escorted you to the feat. Patriotism, love for the motherland and a call to action, that was their main theme. True, we should also mention another side of many songs, especially those with military themes. They mostly reflected yesterday's day. They praised the old military equipment, the old approach to the issues of war, for example, Tachanka rifle, which is helped by a sharp sabre. Almost the most formidable force was considered the cavalry. Unfortunately, we often looked at the army from the perspective of the Civil War. In short, before entering the Great Patriotic War, we acquired a lot of good things that helped us to withstand, and at the same time we had many false, sometimes naive ideas about the future war. For example, we believed that all our weapons were better than those of the enemy, that soldiers from workers and peasants would not shoot at the soldiers of the country of Soviets, that the war would be as we saw it in the movie of Tomorrow is War. For illusions, delusions and mistakes we had to pay dearly, to retrain on the fly, to change many ideas and beliefs. That's how we were, the soldiers who met the war. Yes, there were cowards and traitors among us, but they were few. In general, the defence of the country stood up people who loved the country, devoted to it to the end, hardened in overcoming difficulties, which many of them fell on our shoulders, confident in the rightness of their cause and in victory. It is all of us, Senior Sergeant Brodov, Sergeant Fedorov, Major Sidorenko and others, that is, millions of Soviet people. It is not by chance that in the newspaper published in Nazi Germany, Felkischer Biobakter appeared an article which sex but Russian soldier surpasses our enemy in the West with his contempt for death. Stamina and fanaticism make him hold on until he is killed in a trench or falls dead in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
I, curled up, slept at the bottom of the cell, dug in full height according to all the rules of science that Major Sidorinko had taught us. At the bottom of the cell I laid birch branches to make it softer. I slept uneasily, woke up often, as the stuffiness did not subside even here. Suddenly I heard heavy footsteps and the voice of the platoon commander Brodo. Avakumov! Avakumov! Where are you? Here, yeah, comrade senior sergeant, eeling out of the trench. I mumbled in my sleep. Mm. Come out, you'll go on a mission. I climbed out of the trench with a sniper rifle and an overcoat thrown over my shoulders, pulled out a duffel bag. Roll up your overcoat, tidy yourself up, Brodov said, looking me over. Having made sure that I was ready, Brodov shook his head, which meant, follow me. Sneaking through the rear of the regiment's defences, we came to the forest where Captain Levchenko's battalion was entrenched. Brodov stopped. We were there, on the edge of the forest, the headquarters. You'll introduce yourself properly. They'll explain everything to you there. The mission will be serious. I wish it all ends well. We'll meet after the mission. Rodolf shook my hand and quickly disappeared in the direction where the school was holding its defences. It was the last conversation with the man whom I had respected so much and had managed to love like my own father. I would never meet Rodolf, Fedorov or Sidorenko again. All my efforts after the war to find out about the fate of these people remained fruitless. The headquarters was located not far from the woods, on the eastern slope of a hillock. From it we could see the entire defence of the 2nd Battalion. It stretched along the edge of the birch pine which horseshoe wrapped around the height. The roadway, which was under the control of the battalion, was visible to the west for a couple of kilometres. The headquarters itself was a small dugout, made hastily overnight. There was a trench about ten metres long, obviously a shelter for an artillery at well, and the most important thing was on the surface. Several thick stumps from pine trees were used here as desks. Nearby a telecommunicator was on duty near the telephone equipment. Half-drowsy liaisons from the companies were also bored here. There was no one from the commanders except for a tall, thin lieutenant who, shining a pocket flashlight, was looking at the map. But in the meantime it had so dawned that the light of the flashlight was no longer needed. I clicked my heels and clearly introduced myself to the lieutenant in the official way. He waved his hand lazily but expressively. I could understand from his gesture, to hell with these statutory formalities. So, from the regimental, how are you feeling? Not afraid? The task is a serious one. So, Avakumov, the lieutenant muttered, looking at my Red Army book and comparing its records with the paper that was lying on the map, pressed down by a stone. From his behaviour one could understand that he did not notice me at all, and did everything that he said and did machine. Then he stood up abruptly and looked at me predatorily. I hadn't expected the lieutenant to be so tall. If we were measuring, I probably would not reach his chin with the back of my head, although I am tall myself. The lieutenant stood and asked me a bunch of questions one after another, but did not demand an answer. Then, taking one piece of paper from the stump, he handed it to me. Zinnikam, order assigning you to the reconnaissance group. Hand it to Lieutenant Igorov personally. Go there straight ahead. He pointed in the direction of the rear of the battalion. And permission to go. I clicked my heels. But the lieutenant either didn't hear me, or pretended not to hear me, and again plunged into studying the map only without the help of a flashlight. Lieutenant Egorov, having read the order fluently, slipped it carelessly into his uniform pocket. As if by the way, he asked, Mo, who recommended you, Brodov? Yes. In, we were in the Finnish war together. He carried me, frostbitten, five kilometres on himself. Igorov quickly rambled in passing, and, looking contemptuously at my SVT, he The Studorga put over there, near the pyramid, and in the back of the car take the machine gun and discs. Give all the documents to the petty officer, our petty officer, and take the third squad. Guys are waiting for you. You as if from a machine gun, Igorov, fell out and pointed to a group of fighters who sat on the lawn, smoking and talking about something. Igorov himself, as if forgetting about me, went to another group of fighters who were preparing machine guns. I introduced myself to the squad. The guys were all tall, strong. Among them especially stood out a slender Georgian with a small moustache, who called himself Ota Grivads. He resembled a racehorse with his sharp movements, sharpness of his gaze and some constant springiness. On his face there was a mischievous smile. Dazzling white teeth gleamed. Black moustache emphasised their whiteness. Grivadzi examined me carefully, 
with mischievous and cunning curiosity. It was obvious that the fighter is not completely indifferent to how well they picked up the commander. On the spot run Pressel dress, I commanded I on the spot run march, and then faster, higher leg. On the faces of the soldiers expressed bewilderment, and Grivadzi's eyes flashed with sparks of anger, but the squad obeyed my commands. Jean's squad halt, I commanded, and then explained that ammunition was rattling in the bags, and discs were clanging in the bags. I told the men to tighten the cartridges with rags and do everything possible to make no noise when moving around. The bewilderment of the fighters dissipated, and Grivadzi's white-toothed smile reappeared on his face. Turning back, I saw that Lieutenant Igorov was watching my actions. From the expression on his face, I realized that the commander was pleased with what he saw, but pretended to be busy with his own affairs. By mid-afternoon, two tanks and four trucks arrived at the place where the fighters were preparing for a reconnaissance battle. From the cabin of the truck came out of the head of reconnaissance Lieutenant Ignatiev. He simplistically, by the hand, said hello to Igorov. By the attitude of the commanders was evident that they know each other well. While the lieutenants discussed their business, we huddled around the combat vehicles. They were T-34 tanks, which most of us, including me, had seen for the first time, although we had heard a lot about them. At that time, the KV heavy tanks were especially popular. They were legendary. It was said that they were armoured, moving fortresses that had no equal in the world. But, as the war will show, we were deeply mistaken, underestimating the 30 quarter. It will be recognised as the best tank of the Second World War. While the tankers camouflaged their vehicles, we felt the armour asked about the capabilities of this fighting technique. The assistant commander of the reconnaissance platoon, Petty Officer Sardikov, appeared from the bushes and warned the soldiers not to disperse, that in 15-20 minutes there would be a formation. Where are the commanders? I wondered. Yes, everyone is arguing. Lieutenant Agorov insists that each squad was given two handheld machine guns, and Ignatiev says that one is enough, answered Sadikov. Well, whose take? Ignatiev conceded to Egorov. Although he is the head of intelligence. Igorov has a lot of combat experience, he said Sadikov, and looking at his watch, gave the command. As your reconnaissance platoon, come out to line up. The reconnaissance platoon lined up in a clearing in front of a birch forest, where camouflaged vehicles and tanks stood close to the trees. Sadikov reported to Ignatiev, who came up with Egorov and Tanker, Junior Lieutenant Valuev. Hey, at ease. Listen to the combat mission, began Ignatiev. He spoke as if he was reading a report. The task of reconnaissance was that our group, supported by tanks, determined the main direction of movement of enemy troops and its strength. The method of action, apite from ambush. Now we must pay special attention to the two roads leading to Kaunas. Disbanding the platoon, Dignity of ordered to arm the unit with hand machine guns. We left in the evening at about five or six o'clock. In front of our column were tanks. Lieutenant Ignatiev was riding in the first of them, leaning out of the hatch. We were moving along the grader in the western direction. There was dead silence all around. All the dust, raised by the tracks of tanks, fell on us riding on the trucks. The column was closed by a car, in the back of which there were barrels with fuel. After driving about thirty kilometres, we did not meet any farms. In a pine forest where for some reason the road was not so dusty, we saw a stubby little man with a stick in his hand. Hearing the noise of engines and tracks, he stopped on the side of the road. The head tank stopped. Ignatiev climbed out of the turret and began to ask the Muzikonku about something. Igorov approached them. After about three or four minutes, Igorov returned with the stranger to the car and got into the back with him. While we were driving, Yegorov scrutinized the stranger and his bag with obvious displeasure. What have you got there? Yegorov asked the man. Merkarchi, Commander Karchi. Our travel companion shuddered and whispered fearfully. After passing a pine forest, the little man fidgeted and turned to Igorov with a begging look. Mr. Commander, please stop. That's my farm there. My children are waiting for me. He babbled in a high-pitched voice. Igorov banged his fist on the cabin a couple of times. The car stopped, and our travelling companion seemed to be carried out of it. He hurriedly walked toward the thick shrubbery, behind which the forest began. Riding on the front tank Ignatiev, not understanding what's wrong, stopped the column, and, getting off the armour, went to Igorov's car. What's the matter? Igorov was asked by the commander of the car. 
A fellow traveller said that his farm was there. Igorov showed him in the direction where the man had disappeared. And at that time a red rocket flew from the edge of the forest in the direction where the road led. We silently looked at the rocket. Igorov grabbed the machine gunner's handgun, loaded with disc, and almost completely landed it on the place where the rocket flew up. Returning the weapon to the machine gunner, he swore profanely. So much for vigilance. He said that no one should be put down. And we are such good men. We gave ourselves a ride on our necks. Our commander spat without looking at anyone. We realized that this reproach was addressed to the chief of intelligence. Ignatiev went to the head tank. After half an hour, the column stopped. The commanders stepped aside and discussed something, poking their fingers at the map. It was felt that the conversation was in high tones. At that time, we heard the approaching noise of an airplane. Ignatiev commanded that the cars were driven into the forest. The fighters were ordered to take cover in the bushes, away from the cars. Not far from us flew frame. A German reconnaissance plane. It flew near the road, spun over the pine forest, which we passed about twenty minutes ago, and flew away without finding anything. Hmm, someone must have radioed us about our progress. And the rocket was a conditional signal, as if for himself, said Igorov. Ignatiev looked guiltily at his comrade and gave the command to drive out on the road. By dawn we arrived on the highway. The commanders checked the location on the maps. By all indications it turned out to be exactly the road on which we should determine the fascist forces moving in the direction of Kaunas. Ignatiev ordered the tankers to choose a position with the front to the west. The vehicles gave up 300 metres from the road and camouflaged themselves. On both sides of the road for 8100 metres was clear. Further began shrubbery, which gradually passed into the forest. Igorov on the left side of the road positioned two squads, reinforcing them with three calculations of hand machine guns and two my squad. Reinforced by a manual machine gun from the first squad, Igorov placed on the right side of the road. According to the commander's plan, we should miss the German column's combat guard. At the signal green rocket tankers fire from guns should divide the column into several parts. A section at this time opens fire. The Germans, having come to their senses, must leave the vehicles and take cover on the left side of the road, that is, with their backs to the positions of the first and second divisions. This is where the Stankachi and manuals open fire. But the enemy will come to his senses after a while. The third squad may be cut off from their road. Therefore, our task was to fire no more than ten minutes, and then by a gully, which was behind us fifty metres and stretched along the road, rush to reach the saddle, where the road passes behind the positions of the tankers, cross it, and then the commanders intended to use the department according to the situation that will develop during this time. Having occupied their lines, the squads entrenched and camouflaged positions. From the western direction we heard the noise of engines. We were alert, preparing for battle, however it was four of our light tanks T-26. Ignatiev tried to stop the vehicles, but they rushed past, almost drowned the head of the reconnaissance with their tracks. A minute or three later in the same direction passed three cars with people. They managed to stop them. In the trucks were mostly women and children. These are the families of the commanders. From them we learned that the Germans are not far away. On the road is moving a large column of motorized infantry accompanied by tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery. It was assumed that the column could appear here in about half an hour. Egorov, having checked our positions, warned us not to get involved in a protracted battle. It is necessary to sow panic in the enemy, to create a traffic jam on the road. He reminded us that in ten minutes after the beginning of the battle, we should reach the backside of the heights by rushing through the gully, cross the road and go to the cars. The lay can end badly. Got it? Egorov asked and headed to the other side of the road. Then I saw that next to me sat the assistant platoon commander Petty Officer Sidikov. Probably Igorov does not rely on me and decided to back me up, I thought. Not even half an hour passed, as from the west we heard the noise of engines. We were alert. Where the highway leaves the forest, a group of motorcyclists appeared. In each sidecar sat a machine gunner. Combat guard at low speed drove through an open place, past a high rise resembling a hump. A minute or two later showed three light tanks. The Germans, apparently, did not notice the well-disguised ambush, and the tanks disappeared behind the hump. Then the main part of the column showed up. In front was an armoured personnel carrier, and behind him at an interval of 20-30 metres were vehicles with motorised infantry, between the second and third a black car. 
The Germans in the backs of the cars were cautiously looking around. Suddenly the first car slowed down. The Germans gave some cues on the sides and the column moved again. Machine gun bursts cut the tops of bushes behind which our squad lurked. Cut leaves and branches fell on our heads. And then a green rocket soared up. The first shell of the 30 checker set the armoured personnel carrier on fire. Another one raised a car on the fringes and put it across the road. The next car jammed into the ditch. The Germans began to jump out of the vehicles and scatter in different directions. The red flare had not yet appeared, as the squad on the opposite side of the road opened fire with all the weapons it had. As it turned out afterwards, this deviation from the adopted plan happened, because the bush in which the first and second squads had started was about 30 metres away from the road. When the guns of our tanks struck, the Germans rushed to the bushes and could crush the soldiers who had settled there. So they had to shoot the enemies without delay, almost at point-blank range. Some of them began to jump in the opposite direction, that is to us. But as we were farther from the road, we were in no danger of that. At first I intended to give the command fire when the Germans would approach us by 50 metres. But I couldn't stand it. I gave the command earlier and simultaneously pressed the trigger of my automatic rifle when the Germans had not yet reached the milestones marking 70 metres, which I had put up so that the soldiers could better use the aiming frame. Having met the fire, the Germans scattered but then came to their senses, lay down and began to answer us with fire. Our tanks from their guns hit the column. Several cars were burning, including a passenger car which was lying upside down in a ditch. Not that I was confused, not that I was carried away by the battle and forgot that I had to command the squad. About 40 metres away from me, three Germans jumped out and firing as they ran at me. I gave two short bursts. Only one of them stopped and, crouching, ducked to the ground. I thought I was finished, but immediately my neighbour with a hand machine gun mowed them down. I used up two discs and made sure that my fire was not very effective. They are an individual fascists I had to give three turns before I could put them down. Then I had a thought. How right was Igorov, who insisted that each squad to reinforce each additional handheld machine gun. After we repulsed the Germans who were attacking us, there was an incomprehensible lull interrupted by separate shots and bursts. What it meant, we found out later. Having come to his senses and assessed the situation, the enemy realised that there were not so many forces in the ambush. The surviving fascists little by little began to gather in their units and tried to attack us, gradually approaching our ambush. At the edge of the forest, the Germans pulled out several guns, which, by the way, in time noticed our tankers. This helped to quickly suppress the enemy's guns. But also, our gun fire became greasier. One 30 Chetberker jammed the cannon. It was felt that the situation was changing dramatically. Someone hand tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around. It was Sadikov who crawled up and, pointing at his watch, made it clear that the time was long gone and that it was urgent to leave. It was as if I woke up and felt like a squad commander again. I did with all my my. Squad, fall back, and we all rushed back to the gully. At that time a group of Germans rushed to cut off our retreat to the hill behind which we had to cross the road. Another group was surrounding us on the other flank. But then flank machine gun fire from a tank with a jammed gun cut both groups off from our positions and forced the enemy to lie down. I don't know at what speed we were running. I remember one thing. We ran without avoiding bushes and without feeling the branches hitting our faces. Only in the car I began to understand what was going on. The column of our vehicles drove back from the grader about seven kilometres, turned into the forest. Lieutenant Egorov ordered to shut down the vehicles. We began to wait for the tanks. Soon they appeared. Lieutenant Ignatiev jumped out of the hatch of the damaged tank, followed by Junior Lieutenant Valuev with a bandaged hand. We thought that he was wounded. It turned out that the commander of the tankers, while trying to restore the operability of the rotary mechanism of the gun, scratched his hand badly. The mood of the soldiers and commanders was depressed. Four were killed, one seriously, and three others lightly wounded. The commanders gathered around the tank and began to discuss what to do next. The main task we accomplished. The fulfilment of the second, as ordered, depends on the circumstances. What shall we do? Turn to the commander's ignitive will to fulfil the second. There are forces for this, as if in passing, Igorov muttered in passing. Ignative said he thought the same. Putting a clipboard under a piece of paper, he began to write a report. 
According to the commanders, the column moved at least a regiment of motorized infantry, reinforced by units of tanks and artillery. Thus, how many Germans and equipment did we put down? Ignatiev again turned to the commanders. And who counted how many, and when was to count? Riley noted Igorov. Well, at least approximately, insisted Ignatiev. And the side of the road, where the first and second squad operated, all strewn with enemy corpses. In the zone of action of the third squad, tall grass, there and approximately cannot estimate. And those who were caught by shells and bullets in the car, Egor of reasoned. Well, at least approximately, repeated Ignatiev. With killed and wounded people, 120, 130 will be. 29. After all, almost at point blank range, Valuva entered the conversation. We agreed that not to give figures and write that almost a company of the enemy was destroyed. About the German losses in equipment also wrote approximately, but their own losses were in the report accurate. True, Valuev insisted that he was removed from the number of wounded. It's not a wound, but a scratch. Not from a bullet, not from splinters, Valuev argued. Ignatiev ordered to refuel tanks and vehicles. Empty barrels were thrown out of the back of the truck. The commander of the reconnaissance gave the package with the report to the chauffeur and ordered the same road back to the regiment. With the same car sent two machine gunners and a seriously wounded fighter. At the edge of the clearing near three large pine trees, the soldiers were finishing digging a grave. Here on homemade stretchers they brought the dead. The stretchers were placed next to each other. Near one of them a fighter was squatting and crying. He drove away flies with his cap, which annoyingly besieged the face of the dead man. Hey, for a fellow countryman the lad was killing himself. From the same village taken together, he I heard Grivadze's voice from behind. A short stocky fighter came to the dead, closed the half-open eyes of the dead, and put copper coins on them. Ignatiev built a reconnaissance. He gave commands in a low voice. He nodded his head to the fighters who brought the dead, took out a pistol. The other commanders did the same. The dead were lowered into the grave, covered with overcoats. The soldiers, one by one, walked in a chain past the grave, throwing into it a handful of earth. Ignatiev wiped his tears with his sleeve. I, trying not to show my weakness, kept from crying. Hey, forgive us, comrades, if we did something wrong, not quite according to custom. We were not taught to do so. Thank you for fighting bravely for your land. May it rest in peace. We will avenge the enemy for you, said Ignatiev. He wanted to add something else, but could not. Grief choked him, and he choked. The commanders fired three shots from their pistols. The tankers cut out a star from an iron plate with a chisel, attached it to a peg, and Ignatiev wrote with a chemical pencil on the hewn place the surnames and names of the dead, their years of birth and the date of death. The farewell to the comrades made a heavy impression on everyone. Everyone thought, probably, one thing. To whom the next war will prepare such a death, how many more will be scattered around the country such modest graves, and how many of them will be lost forever? After all, the war is just beginning. There is probably nothing more terrible than the unknown, not knowing what will happen to you today, tomorrow. Half an hour after bidding farewell to the dead, Ignatiev gave the command. To the cars. Our column moved to fulfill the second part of its task. The road on which we were to establish the advance of the enemy forces was riddled with the tracks of tanks. On the loosened sand clearly outlined the traces of the wheels of vehicles. In the place where we left, there was silence. Apparently, the German units had passed along the road a long time ago, and therefore we could hear neither the noise of engines nor voices. Our commanders decided to make an ambush here too. This time we positioned ourselves on one side of the road, where the roadway perpendicularly crosses it. We decided to cut off the tail of the enemy column, destroy it in a short battle and break through to our own. For this purpose two fighters were left 300 meters to the west. They disguised themselves and had to watch the progress of the column. When its tail will be leveled with them, they will let them know with a green rocket, and they themselves will run to the place of gathering, where it was supposed to give the enemy a fight from an ambush. On the opposite side of the highway to the forest closely approached the forest, and on our side stretched a flat clearing of 50 meters from the road to the forest. The clearing stretched for a hundred meters along the highway. We prepared for battle and waited. Here, yeah, comrade senior sergeant, he leaned out of the trench. I mumbled in my sleep. Hmm, come out, you'll go on a mission. 
I climbed out of the trench with a sniper rifle and an overcoat thrown over my shoulders, pulled out a duffel bag. Roll up your overcoat, tidy yourself up, Brodov said, looking me over. Having made sure that I was ready, Brodov shook his head, which meant, follow me. Sneaking through the rear of the regiment's defences, we came to the forest where Captain Levchenko's battalion was entrenched. Brodov stopped. We were there, on the edge of the forest, the headquarters. You'll introduce yourself properly. They'll explain everything to you there. The mission will be serious. I wish it all ends well. We'll meet after the mission. Rodolf shook my hand and quickly disappeared in the direction where the school was holding its defences. It was the last conversation with the man whom I had respected so much and had managed to love like my own father. I would never meet Rodolf, Fedorov or Sidorenko again. All my efforts after the war to find out about the fate of these people remained fruitless. The headquarters was located not far from the woods, on the eastern slope of a hillock. From it we could see the entire defence of the 2nd Battalion. It stretched along the edge of the birch pine which horseshoe wrapped around the height. The roadway, which was under the control of the battalion, was visible to the west for a couple of kilometres. The headquarters itself was a small dugout, made hastily overnight. There was a trench about ten metres long, obviously a shelter for an artillery at well, and the most important thing was on the surface. Several thick stumps from pine trees were used here as desks. Nearby a telecommunicator was on duty near the telephone equipment. Half-drowsy liaisons from the companies were also bored here. There was no one from the commanders except for a tall, thin lieutenant who, shining a pocket flashlight, was looking at the map. But in the meantime it had so dawned that the light of the flashlight was no longer needed. I clicked my heels and clearly introduced myself to the lieutenant in the official way. He waved his hand lazily but expressively. I could understand from his gesture, to hell with these statutory formalities. So, from the regimental, how are you feeling? Not afraid? The task is a serious one. So, Avakamov, the lieutenant muttered, looking at my Red Army book and comparing its records with the paper that was lying on the map, pressed down by a stone. From his behaviour one could understand that he did not notice me at all, and did everything that he said and did machine. Then he stood up abruptly and looked at me predatorily. I hadn't expected the lieutenant to be so tall. If we were measuring I probably would not reach his chin with the back of my head, Although I am tall myself, the lieutenant stood and asked me a bunch of questions one after another, but did not demand an answer. Then, taking one piece of paper from the stump, he handed it to me. Zinnikam, order assigning you to the reconnaissance group. Hand it to Lieutenant Igorov personally. Go there straight ahead, he pointed in the direction of the rear of the battalion. And permission to go. I clicked my heels. But the lieutenant either didn't hear me or pretended not to hear me and again plunged into studying the map only without the help of a flashlight. Lieutenant Egorov, having read the order fluently, slipped it carelessly into his uniform pocket. As if by the way, he asked, Mo, who recommended you, Brodov? Yes. In, we were in the Finnish war together. He carried me, frostbitten, five kilometres on himself. Egorov quickly rambled in passing, and looking contemptuously at my SVT, he the Studorga put over there, near the pyramid, and in the back of the car take the machine gun and discs. Give all the documents to the petty officer, our petty officer. And take the third squad. Guys are waiting for you. You as if from a machine gun, Igorov, fell out and pointed to a group of fighters who sat on the lawn, smoking and talking about something. Igorov himself, as if forgetting about me, went to another group of fighters who were preparing machine guns. I introduced myself to the squad. The guys were all tall, strong. Among them especially stood out a slender Georgian with a small moustache, who called himself Ota Grivads. He resembled a racehorse with his sharp movements, sharpness of his gaze and some constant springiness. On his face there was a mischievous smile. Dazzling white teeth gleamed. Black moustache emphasised their whiteness. Grivadzi examined me carefully, with mischievous and cunning curiosity. It was obvious that the fighter is not completely indifferent to how well they picked up the commander. On the spot run Prassel dress, I commanded, I on the spot run march, and then faster, higher leg. On the faces of the soldiers expressed bewilderment, and Grivadzi's eyes flashed with sparks of anger, but the squad obeyed my commands. Jean squad halt, I commanded, and then explained that ammunition was rattling in the bags, and discs were clanging in the bags. 
I told the men to tighten the cartridges with rags and do everything possible to make no noise when moving around. The bewilderment of the fighters dissipated, and Grivadzi's white-toothed smile reappeared on his face. Turning back, I saw that Lieutenant Igorov was watching my actions. From the expression on his face, I realized that the commander was pleased with what he saw, but pretended to be busy with his own affairs. By mid-afternoon, two tanks and four trucks arrived at the place where the fighters were preparing for a reconnaissance battle. From the cabin of the truck came out of the head of reconnaissance Lieutenant Ignatiev. He simplistically, by the hand, said hello to Igorov. By the attitude of the commanders was evident that they know each other well. While the lieutenants discussed their business, we huddled around the combat vehicles. They were T-34 tanks, which most of us, including me, had seen for the first time, although we had heard a lot about them. At that time, the KV heavy tanks were especially popular. They were legendary. It was said that they were armoured, moving fortresses that had no equal in the world. But, as the war will show, we were deeply mistaken, underestimating the 30 quarter. It will be recognised as the best tank of the Second World War. While the tankers camouflaged their vehicles, we felt the armour, asked about the capabilities of this fighting technique. The assistant commander of the reconnaissance platoon, Petty Officer Sardikov, appeared from the bushes and warned the soldiers not to disperse, that in 15-20 minutes there would be a formation. Where are the commanders? I wondered. Yes, everyone is arguing. Lieutenant Agorov insists that each squad was given two handheld machine guns, and Ignatiev says that one is enough, answered Sadikov. Well, whose take? Ignatiev conceded to Egorov. Although he is the head of intelligence, Igorov has a lot of combat experience, he said Sadikov, and looking at his watch, gave the command as a reconnaissance platoon, come out to line up. The reconnaissance platoon lined up in a clearing in front of a birch forest, where camouflaged vehicles and tanks stood close to the trees. Sadikov reported to Ignatiev, who came up with Egorov and Tanker, Junior Lieutenant Valuev. Hey, at ease. Listen to the combat mission, began Ignatiev. He spoke as if he was reading a report. The task of reconnaissance was that our group, supported by tanks, determined the main direction of movement of enemy troops and its strength. The method of action, a pite from ambush. Now we must pay special attention to the two roads leading to Kaunas. Disbanding the platoon, Dignity of ordered to arm the unit with hand machine guns. We left in the evening at about five or six o'clock. In front of our column were tanks. Lieutenant Ignatiev was riding in the first of them, leaning out of the hatch. We were moving along the grader in the western direction. There was dead silence all around. All the dust, raised by the tracks of tanks, fell on us riding on the trucks. The column was closed by a car, in the back of which there were barrels with fuel. After driving about thirty kilometres, we did not meet any farms. In a pine forest where for some reason the road was not so dusty, we saw a stubby little man with a stick in his hand. Hearing the noise of engines and tracks, he stopped on the side of the road. The head tank stopped. Ignatiev climbed out of the turret and began to ask the Muzhikonku about something. Igorov approached them. After about three or four minutes, Igorov returned with the stranger to the car and got into the back with him. While we were driving, Yegorov scrutinized the stranger and his bag with obvious displeasure. What have you got there? Yegorov asked the man. Merkarchi, Commander Karchi. Our travel companion shuddered and whispered fearfully. After passing a pine forest, the little man fidgeted and turned to Igorov with a begging look. Mr. Commander, please stop. That's my farm there. My children are waiting for me. He babbled in a high-pitched voice. Igorov banged his fist on the cabin a couple of times. The car stopped, and our travelling companion seemed to be carried out of it. He hurriedly walked toward the thick shrubbery, behind which the forest began. Riding on the front tank Ignatiev, not understanding what's wrong, stopped the column, and, getting off the armour, went to Igorov's car. What's the matter? Igorov was asked by the commander of the car. A fellow traveller said that his farm was there. Igorov showed him in the direction where the man had disappeared and at that time a red rocket flew from the edge of the forest in the direction where the road led. We silently looked at the rocket. Egorov grabbed the machine gunner's handgun, loaded with disc, and almost completely landed it on the place where the rocket flew up. Returning the weapon to the machine gunner, he swore profanely. So much for vigilance. He said that no one should be put down. And we are such good men. We gave ourselves a ride on our necks, 
our commander spat without looking at anyone. We realized that this reproach was addressed to the chief of intelligence. Ignatiev went to the head tank. After half an hour, the column stopped. The commanders stepped aside and discussed something, poking their fingers at the map. It was felt that the conversation was in high tones. At that time, we heard the approaching noise of an airplane. Ignatiev commanded that the cars were driven into the forest. The fighters were ordered to take cover in the bushes, away from the cars. Not far from us flew frame. A German reconnaissance plane. It flew near the road, spun over the pine forest, which we passed about 20 minutes ago, and flew away without finding anything. Hmm, someone must have radioed us about our progress. And the rocket was a conditional signal, as if for himself, said Igorov. Ignatiev looked guiltily at his comrade and gave the command to drive out on the road. By dawn we arrived on the highway. The commanders checked the location on the maps. By all indications it turned out to be exactly the road on which we should determine the fascist forces moving in the direction of Kaunas. Ignatiev ordered the tankers to choose a position with the front to the west. The vehicles gave up 300 metres from the road and camouflaged themselves. On both sides of the road for 8100 metres was clear. Further began shrubbery, which gradually passed into the forest. Igorov on the left side of the road positioned two squads, reinforcing them with three calculations of hand machine guns and two my squad. Reinforced by a manual machine gun from the first squad, Igorov placed on the right side of the road. According to the commander's plan, we should miss the German column's combat guard. At the signal green rocket tanker's fire from guns should divide the column into several parts. A section at this time opens fire. The Germans, having come to their senses, must leave the vehicles and take cover on the left side of the road, that is, with their backs to the positions of the first and second divisions. This is where the Stankachi and manuals open fire. But the enemy will come to his senses after a while. The third squad may be cut off from their road. Therefore, our task was to fire no more than ten minutes, and then by a gully, which was behind us fifty metres and stretched along the road, rush to reach the saddle, where the road passes behind the positions of the tankers, cross it, and then the commanders intended to use the department according to the situation that will develop during this time. Having occupied their lines, the squads entrenched and camouflaged positions. From the western direction we heard the noise of engines. We were alert, preparing for battle, however it was four of our light tanks T-26. Ignatiev tried to stop the vehicles, but they rushed past, almost drowned the head of the reconnaissance with their tracks. A minute or three later in the same direction passed three cars with people. They managed to stop them. In the trucks were mostly women and children. These are the families of the commanders. From them we learned that the Germans are not far away. On the road is moving a large column of motorized infantry accompanied by tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery. It was assumed that the column could appear here in about half an hour. Egorov, having checked our positions, warned us not to get involved in a protracted battle. It is necessary to sow panic in the enemy, to create a traffic jam on the road. He reminded us that in ten minutes after the beginning of the battle, we should reach the backside of the heights by rushing through the gully, cross the road and go to the cars. The lake can end badly. Got it? Egorov asked and headed to the other side of the road. Then I saw that next to me sat the assistant platoon commander Petty Officer Sidikov. Probably Igorov does not rely on me and decided to back me up, I thought. Not even half an hour passed, as from the west we heard the noise of engines. We were alert. Where the highway leaves the forest, a group of motorcyclists appeared. In each sidecar sat a machine gunner. Combat guard at low speed drove through an open place, past a high rise resembling a hump. A minute or two later showed three light tanks. The Germans, apparently, did not notice the well-disguised ambush, and the tanks disappeared behind the hump. Then the main part of the column showed up. In front was an armoured personnel carrier, and behind him at an interval of 20-30 metres were vehicles with motorised infantry, between the second and third a black car. The Germans in the backs of the cars were cautiously looking around. Suddenly the first car slowed down. The Germans gave some cues on the sides, and the column moved again. Machine gun bursts cut the tops of bushes behind which our squad lurked. Cut leaves and branches fell on our heads. And then a green rocket soared up. The first shell of the 30 checker set the armoured personnel carrier on fire. Another one raised a car on the fringes and put it across the road. The next car jammed into the ditch. 
the Germans began to jump out of the vehicles and scatter in different directions. The red flare had not yet appeared, as the squad on the opposite side of the road opened fire with all the weapons it had. As it turned out afterwards, this deviation from the adopted plan happened, because the bush in which the first and second squads had started was about 30 metres away from the road. When the guns of our tanks struck, the Germans rushed to the bushes and could crush the soldiers who had settled there. So they had to shoot the enemies without delay, almost at point-blank range. Some of them began to jump in the opposite direction, that is to us. But as we were farther from the road, we were in no danger of that. At first I intended to give the command fire when the Germans would approach us by 50 metres. But I couldn't stand it. I gave the command earlier and simultaneously pressed the trigger of my automatic rifle when the Germans had not yet reached the milestones marking 70 metres, which I had put up so that the soldiers could better use the aiming frame. Having met the fire, the Germans scattered, but then came to their senses, lay down and began to answer us with fire. Our tanks from their guns hit the column. Several cars were burning, including a passenger car which was lying upside down in a ditch. Not that I was confused, not that I was carried away by the battle and forgot that I had to command the squad. About 40 metres away from me, three Germans jumped out and firing as they ran at me. I gave two short bursts. Only one of them stopped and, crouching, ducked to the ground. I thought I was finished, but immediately my neighbour with a hand machine gun mowed them down. I used up two discs and made sure that my fire was not very effective. Uh, on individual fascists I had to give three turns before I could put them down. Then I had a thought. How right was Igorov, who insisted that each squad to reinforce each additional handheld machine gun. After we repulsed the Germans who were attacking us, there was an incomprehensible lull interrupted by separate shots and bursts. What it meant we found out later. Having come to his senses and assessed the situation, the enemy realised that there were not so many forces in the ambush. The surviving fascists little by little began to gather in their units and tried to attack us, gradually approaching our ambush. At the edge of the forest the Germans pulled out several guns, which, by the way, in time noticed our tankers. This helped to quickly suppress the enemy's guns. But also our gun fire became greasier. One 30 Chetberka jammed the cannon. It was felt that the situation was changing dramatically. Some on hand tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around. It was Sadikov who crawled up and, pointing at his watch, made it clear that the time was long gone and that it was urgent to leave. It was as if I woke up and felt like a squad commander again. I did with all my might. Squad, fall back, and we all rushed back to the gully. At that time a group of Germans rushed to cut off our retreat to the hill behind which we had to cross the road. Another group was surrounding us on the other flank. But then flank machine gun fire from a tank with a jammed gun cut both groups off from our positions and forced the enemy to lie down. I don't know at what speed we were running. I remember one thing. We ran without avoiding bushes and without feeling the branches hitting our faces. Only in the car I began to understand what was going on. The column of our vehicles drove back from the grader about seven kilometres, turned into the forest. Lieutenant Egorov ordered to shut down the vehicles. We began to wait for the tanks. Soon they appeared. Lieutenant Ignatiev jumped out of the hatch of the damaged tank, followed by Junior Lieutenant Valuev with a bandaged hand. We thought that he was wounded. It turned out that the commander of the tankers, while trying to restore the operability of the rotary mechanism of the gun, scratched his hand badly. The mood of the soldiers and commanders was depressed. Four were killed, one seriously, and three others lightly wounded. The commanders gathered around the tank and began to discuss what to do next. The main task we accomplished. The fulfilment of the second, as ordered, depends on the circumstances. What shall we do? Turn to the commander's ignative will to fulfil the second. There are forces for this, as if in passing, Igorov muttered in passing. Ignative said he thought the same. Putting a clipboard under a piece of paper, he began to write a report. According to the commanders, the column moved at least a regiment of motorised infantry reinforced by units of tanks and artillery. Thus, how many Germans and equipment did we put down? Ignatiev again turned to the commanders. And who counted how many, and when was to count? Riley noted Igorov. Well, at least approximately, insisted Ignatiev. And the side of the road, where the first and second squad operated, all strewn with enemy corpses. In the zone of action of the third squad, 
tall grass, there and approximately cannot estimate. And those who are caught by shells and bullets in the car, Egor of reasoned. Well, at least approximately, repeated ignitive. With killed and wounded people, 120, 130 will be. 29. After all, almost at point blank range, Valuva entered the conversation. We agreed that not to give figures and write that almost a company of the enemy was destroyed. About the German losses in equipment also wrote approximately, but their own losses were in the report accurate. True, Valuev insisted that he was removed from the number of wounded. It's not a wound, but a scratch. Not from a bullet, not from splinters, Valuev argued. Ignatiev ordered to refuel tanks and vehicles. Empty barrels were thrown out of the back of the truck. The commander of the reconnaissance gave the package with the report to the chauffeur and ordered the same road back to the regiment. With the same car sent two machine gunners and a seriously wounded fighter. At the edge of the clearing near three large pine trees, the soldiers were finishing digging a grave. Here on homemade stretchers they brought the dead. The stretchers were placed next to each other. Near one of them a fighter was squatting and crying. He drove away flies with his cap, which annoyingly besieged the face of the dead man. For a fellow countryman the lad was killing himself. From the same village taken together, ye I heard Grivadze's voice from behind. A short stocky fighter came to the dead, closed the half-open eyes of the dead, and put copper coins on them. Ignatiev built a reconnaissance. He gave commands in a low voice. He nodded his head to the fighters who brought the dead, took out a pistol. The other commanders did the same. The dead were lowered into the grave, covered with overcoats. The soldiers, one by one, walked in a chain past the grave, throwing into it a handful of earth. Ignatiev wiped his tears with his sleeve. I, trying not to show my weakness, kept from crying. Hey, forgive us, comrades, if we did something wrong, not quite according to custom. We were not taught to do so. Thank you for fighting bravely for your land. May it rest in peace. We will avenge the enemy for you, said Ignatiev. He wanted to add something else, but could not. Grief choked him, and he choked. The commanders fired three shots from their pistols. The tankers cut out a star from an iron plate with a chisel, attached it to a peg, and Ignatiev wrote with a chemical pencil on the hewn place the surnames and names of the dead, their years of birth and the date of death. The farewell to the comrades made a heavy impression on everyone. Everyone thought, probably, one thing. To whom the next war will prepare such a death, how many more will be scattered around the country such modest graves, and how many of them will be lost forever? After all, the war is just beginning. There is probably nothing more terrible than the unknown, not knowing what will happen to you today, tomorrow. Half an hour after bidding farewell to the dead, Ignatiev gave the command. To the cars. Our column moved to fulfill the second part of its task. The road on which we were to establish the advance of the enemy forces was riddled with the tracks of tanks. On the loosened sand clearly outlined the traces of the wheels of vehicles. In the place where we left, there was silence. Apparently, the German units had passed along the road a long time ago, and therefore we could hear neither the noise of engines nor voices. Our commanders decided to make an ambush here too. This time we positioned ourselves on one side of the road, where the roadway perpendicularly crosses it. We decided to cut off the tail of the enemy column, destroy it in a short battle and break through to our own. For this purpose two fighters were left 300 meters to the west. They disguised themselves and had to watch the progress of the column. When its tail will be leveled with them, they will let them know with a green rocket, and they themselves will run to the place of gathering, where it was supposed to give the enemy a fight from an ambush. On the opposite side of the highway to the forest closely approached the forest, and on our side stretched a flat clearing of 50 meters from the road to the forest. The clearing stretched for a hundred meters along the highway. We prepared for battle and waited. Three hours passed, and there was not a soul on the road. The silence was as if everything had died out. The sun was already setting, and suddenly we heard the noise of vehicles approaching. We passed the combat guard, tanks, motorized infantry, several vehicles carrying cannons, mortar units passed by. It was getting tiresome to look at this enemy power. But here began to appear staff cars, flyers, field kitchens. We realized that somewhere near the end of the column, from the side of our post a rocket soared into the sky. At that time our tanks jumped out of the forest. One from a machine gun, another from a gun began to smash the enemy. The rifle squads opened fire. 
It seemed to me so thick that from under it hardly anyone could escape alive. The Germans offered no resistance, but took cover in the woods, occasionally snapping back with machine gun bursts. This lasted about five minutes. After that, first on the forest where the Germans were sheltering, then on the road, and then on us mines fell. We were given the command to concentrate at the assembly point. By throwing past the strip of fire, we ran to the place where vehicles with engines running were waiting for us. If, when we went there in the back, it was crowded, now in the cars was quite spacious. After waiting for three minutes, our column moved back. After five kilometers, we stopped to wait for the tanks. They appeared only after twenty minutes. The tankers brought three wounded, among them and Lieutenant Igorov. He groaned heavily. Sun instructor tore his uniform, and we saw a wide bleeding wound on his chest. As the tankers told us, they picked up Igorov during the withdrawal. He helped a wounded fighter to walk, but a mine exploded nearby. The soldier, who was supported by Egorov, was immediately struck to death, and the lieutenant was wounded. According to descriptions of tankers, the wounded fighter was Grivard's. By morning, the reconnaissance was already in the regiment. Igorov was brought back dead. He died in severe agony in the arms of the orderly. Having unloaded from the vehicles, we wanted to go to our units. But Lieutenant Ignatiev demanded to stay in place until special order. He himself went to the headquarters. After the report on the results of reconnaissance, Ignatiev built those who returned. There were half as many of us as there were when we were just going on the mission. Ignatiev gave us from the command of the regiment thanks for the fulfillment of the task. He said that we all remained in the special reconnaissance unit which would soon be replenished. Then we said goodbye to Lieutenant Igorov and another fighter who also died on the road, paying them last honours. I tried several times to break out to the location of the school to meet my comrades, but the circumstances were such that there was no time for everything, and somewhere in the afternoon I fell asleep and together with other scouts fell asleep in the back of the car. Petty Officer Sadikov had a great difficulty to shake us up. Get up, get up, we have to get ready for the road. He shook each of us individually. The commander of reconnaissance, having built us up, once again thanked us for our service and introduced us to Senior Lieutenant Seminkin, who, as Ignatiev said, would henceforth command the regiment's reconnaissance instead of him. The lieutenant reported that he was ordered to take over a company in the 1st Battalion. Instead of Igorov, Junior Lieutenant Sajin was appointed platoon commander. He was small in stature, red-haired with a face densely dotted with freckles, choused bewilderment among the soldiers. How to understand that he, such an outwardly unattractive commander, was assigned to command the reconnaissance platoon? It realized Seminkin, who Sajin was on his shoulder, and, turning to the soldiers, Junior Lieutenant Sajin participated in the battles of Kolkin Go, an experienced scout. Not once with the soldiers sneaked into the rear of the Japanese, for bravery and combat deeds awarded the Order of the Red Banner. Such an explanation was necessary. The initial sceptical attitude of the fighters to the commander immediately changed. They began to look at Sajin with curiosity and respect. In the afternoon of June 24, our regiment left the defence and individual columns headed in a northeastern direction. The battalions marched slowly and cautiously. The reason for this was not the heat, but the danger of falling under the treatment of enemy attack aircraft and bombers. The force of their blow the regiment experienced even in the morning, before our return from reconnaissance. We marched along gullies, ravines and dense bushes, through overgrown forests, bypassing open plains and fields with ripening bread. Only two days of the war had passed, and the retreat, almost without fighting, seemed to last forever. But we did not lose hope for a sharp turn in the war, did not believe that we can be defeated. But then, our generals missed a favourable moment. We should have hit the Germans at once when they came to us. We should have crushed them on the march, and now they've stepped on our tail. When else will we break away and turn around to strike? Reasoned Sergeant Yusupov, with whom I was walking next to. Assumed that we will give heat to the fascists. There can be no doubt. But when? I answered him. Further we walked in silence, immersed in unhappy thoughts. The command lie down, took us out of this state. It was drowned out by the whistle of a flying shell. The platoon rushed in different directions at the moment when the shell exploded ahead of the column. The second shell made a flight, and the third exploded in the middle of the column. The shells sprinkled like peas, raising columns of dust, smoke and fire. Then the fire was transferred to the woods, into which part of the head column had already entered. 
When the shaft of fire moved beyond the gully, a train of steamer wagons came up the road. Immediately the enemy's fire was transferred to the wagon train. Dazed horses were darting aside, tearing the straps. Even a tall birch tree could not stop them. Some of them managed to gallop out of this hell. A wagon stopped abruptly near me. The wounded horse, driven by a dazed rider, managed to run 200 meters and collapsed on the ground. The rider with the lush mustache jumped off the wagon, jumped up to the animal. There were tears in the horse's eyes. It looked as if it was asking for help from the rider. He was confused and cried too, looking at his faithful friend. Hey, get down, get down, I shouted to him. Only after a few seconds he came to his senses, jumped to the side and fell to the ground. When the fire ceased, we helped the riders to gather the surviving horses with the wagons and moved on to where we supposed we would meet the enemy. By the middle of the night we came to a railroad junction around which dwellings were burning. The flames well highlighted the settlement. Having crossed the dammed river, which further flowed along the railroad bed, the regiment stopped in the woods. In front of the herd bursts of shells and the sky continuously illuminated by rockets. Having received the order, the rifle battalions moved forward and took up a defence. It ran along the edge of the forest, crossing the railroad embankment and left flanking the river which we crossed. Junior Lieutenant Sajin appeared near our trench. Vakumov, how many men do you have in your squad? he asked. These are seven, I answered. Take all of them and quickly to the regimental headquarters to ensure security and communication with the battalions. Check. He waved his hand in the direction of the defence of the 1st Battalion. Regimental headquarters is located on the left flank of the 1st Battalion, a hundred metres from the front edge of the defence. When we got there, the signalmen were hustling, hurrying to establish communication, and sappers were digging trenches. The regiment commander, Lieutenant Colonel Ivanovsky, set the task to the commanders of units. They received instructions and immediately rushed to their areas of defence the scraps of conversations that I heard. I could imagine that the regiment today will attack together with other parts of the division. The offensive of the 2nd Battalion, occupying the left edge of the regiment's defences, should be supported by a company of light tanks. Fighting should be completed by evening with the capture of the village across the river. And be seen questions. Ivanovsky turned to the combatants. A. The order is clear, but not enough ammunition and grenades. Before the offensive remains nothing and the tanks are not seen. Looking at the clock, said Combat Levchenko, now you will be given some ammunition and grenades, but the tanks I myself am worried about. Be patient. There is still an hour and a half to spare, replied Ivanovsky, though from his face we could understand that he had lost all hope for tank support. At six hours and fifty minutes began artillery preparation for the offensive, but it was so weak that it could not do much harm to the enemy but alerted the Germans. Green rockets went up. Captain Livchenko's battalion was the first to leave the trenches. Lee, being near the command post of the regiment commander, saw well how the companies in an instant rolled down the steep slope of the heights and on the open field, on groping and short runs quickly moved to the river. The divisions without loss quickly passed half the plain, and further on they were met by the dense fire of machine guns and automatic rifles. The tall meadow grass splashed green. But the fire was still low, and the fighters continued to advance to the attack line. The Germans were about 300 metres away. No, It seemed that the last men would pull up, and having risen to the attack, the battalion would sweep the enemy into the river, on his shoulders would rush to the opposite bank of the river and destroy the enemy there. But the unexpected happened. We heard the whistle of shells and howling of mines, and then everything sank in a continuous rumble of explosions. It turned out that the Germans shot this area well. After the first shells flew over, the second ones hit the battalion units. The units returned to their original lines, leaving many dead and wounded on the battlefield. Where there had been a green meadow, the earth was smoking and turned upside down. Serving this picture, Lieutenant Colonel Levonovsky confused. He visibly slouched, losing his former poise, and as if more grey and looked helpless. After a few minutes, the regiment commander regained his former confidence and asked the telephonist to contact Captain Levchenko. With the 2nd Battalion, no communication. A break in the line, answered for the telephonist Lieutenant Orlov. Then go to Levchenko yourself. Find out the situation and immediately go back. Ordered Ivanovsky. Battalions attacked the Germans three times. It seemed about to reach the goal, 
but at the decisive moment could not withstand enemy fire and rolled back to the original positions. Although the 2nd Battalion of Captain Levchenko suffered the heaviest losses and was at a disadvantage, his units had considerable success. The 4th Company captured a bridge across the river, came to the left bank, but could not advance further. The Germans pushed back the battalion units located to the right of the bridge, creating a threat of encirclement and destruction of the 4th Company. We had to leave the left bank and the bridge. But Lieutenant Colonel Ivanovsky did not lose hope to fulfill the task set for the unit. After his return and the report of Lieutenant Orlov, he sent all his reserves against the enemy in the area occupied by the 2nd Battalion. The commander of the regiment apparently hoped to break through the frontier and thus alleviate the situation of other battalions. When leaving the attack line to the initial positions, a group of fighters rushed to run across the clear field to the forest. Lieutenant Colonel Ivanovsky jumped out of the trench and rushed in front of the fleeing. Stop. Where are you going? Cowards, I'll shoot you. He shouted, waving his pistol. The tall fighter who was running ahead stopped like a stumbling block, looked at Ivanovsky for a few seconds, bewildered. Furning back, he waved his hand and shouted. Follow me, boys. The whole group of fighters ran back to where the shells and mines were bursting. At the time when Ivanovsky was turning the trembling platoon, Colonel Tereshenko, Chief of Staff, arrived at the regiment's NP, accompanied by a group of commanders. What's going on here, Lieutenant Colonel? Strictly asked Tereshenko Ivanovsky. The frightened fighters turned around, me applied Ivanovsky. Not fighters, but cowards, not ill you, corrected Tereshenko. After the battle to sort out everything and punish, without listening to Tereshchenko, Ivanovsky came close to the chief of staff and almost in his ear shouted, Wilton's tanks. Where are the tanks? When will the tanks come? When? Without them all the people will lay all the people. Tereshchenko detachedly looked at Ivanovsky and quietly said, Do not wait for tanks. Artillery support today will not be. But the Germans must be driven to the left bank. Count on your own forces. And the group, led by Tereshchenko, left to the cars on which they came here. Observing this picture, we, staff liaison officers and communicators, realised that the regiment was in a critical situation and there was nowhere to wait for help. Lieutenant Orlov contacted the battalion commanders and transmitted by telephone the order to prepare for the offensive. Ivanovsky paced back and forth in the trench at his base. On his face was evident that he did not believe in the success of the offensive. Artillery and mortar fire on our positions increased. Battalions suffered heavy losses. From the division headquarters arrived a lieutenant. He delivered a package to Ivanovsky. After reading it, Ivanovsky called the chief of staff, Major U.D. Love. On the right flank of the division's defence, the Germans have cut two kilometres into the depths and continue to advance. The regiment is threatened with encirclement. The order to withdraw the regiment to the Vilia River, said Ivanovsky relieved. The order to withdraw was transmitted through messengers, as there was no telephone communication. I was ordered to deliver a package to the 3rd Battalion and immediately go back. Combat 3rd I found in the trench on the heights, which was held by Lieutenant Sibertsev's company. The Germans about a dozen times attacked it, but could not take it. The interest of the enemy to this height was not accidental. From it, the whole valley in front of the battalion's defence was observed and shelled. Combat, having read the order, concluded, It's a little late to decide. The Germans are preparing for another attack. We'll beat it back, and then we'll start to retreat. I was heading back to the regiment headquarters. Lieutenant Sibertsev, stop. Now the Germans will start attacking. You better wait it out. I tried to prove that I could sneak into the headquarters, but the lieutenant was inexorable. He rudely cut me off and said, You'll be more useful here. Take a seat over there. Your machine gun will come in handy now. Sibertsev showed with a nod of his head on the neighbouring cell next to the cell, where there were two soldiers with a handheld machine gun. I did not object and prepared for battle. I looked around the slope of the height. It was strewn with the corpses of German soldiers, and rising from behind the bushes, a chain of Hitlerites headed for the heights. Yes, don't open fire without a command. Save ammunition, Yisibertsev command ran. As soon as the Germans came to the foot of the heights and hurriedly rushed forward, the soldiers of the company opened fire. 
The tall officer, who led the attack chain, shuddered, swayed, and fell to the ground. The attackers lay low, and then began to slowly crawl back. Mortars struck the high rise. Most of the mines fell into the target, incapacitating the fighters. Sibertsev was wounded by a shrapnel. A sergeant from his company suggested to the commander to head to the rear. Sibertsev cut him off. No rear. Bandage here. As soon as the bursting of mines was silent, the Germans began to storm the heights again. During the shelling to them came reinforcements. The chains were thicker. Sibertsev commanded fire, but the machine guns were silent. The machine gunner in the cell next to me was killed. The second number was not in place. I pushed the dead man away and, loading a new disc, began to pour long bursts on the attackers. A few minutes later, the machine gun on the left started talking. Sibertsev was shooting and the ribbons were filled by the sergeant who had bandaged his arm. Germans, despite heavy losses and dense fire, persistently climbed forward on the slope of the heights. Prepare grenades. The Germans, having approached our trenches on 30 steps, began to tear off grenades from belts. But Sibertsev's company was ahead of them. A dense wall of explosions, followed by another, stopped the enemy. The fascists trembled and rolled back. Ours followed them with machine guns and automatic weapons. Well, now they will not rise at once. A respite will be needed, mm, said Sibertsev. Having made sure that the neighbors left their lines, he decided to withdraw the company. Are you going with us or to the regiment? He asked me. Hmm, to the regiment. Well, look. Sibertsev shook his head and looked at me with some sympathy. Where the regiment headquarters was, there was no one. I felt creepy. At first I thought I was lost, but after a closer look I realized that I was right. I turned to the east and listened. In that direction where I thought Sibertsev's company was going, there was the crackle of German machine guns, and to the right where, as I supposed, there should be a settlement and a roadblock, through which we passed at night, I heard rifle shots mixed with German machine gun bursts. I ran toward the station to join my own. The silence here, where the headquarters was, was more frightening than the battle itself. I ran as fast as I could to where they were firing, and in fifteen minutes I was already at the station, falling under the bushes. I began to observe what was being done here. In several places wagons were burning, at the level of the wheels feet flashed. Here and there I heard the crackle of machine guns, rifle shots and saw flashes of fire. I had to determine where we ours and where were the Germans and make a decision for further action. Near the nearest wagons I saw a group of fighters. They were lying down and occasionally fired in response to machine gun bursts, which were heard from the direction of the cluster of wagons in the middle of the station, and from the silhouettes and shadows that flickered in the flames of the burning wagons. I could understand that the Germans hoped to cut off the way to the dam, the only way to the other side. Having assessed the situation, I crawled up to the soldiers. Do you have ammunition in discs? I asked the fighter with the handheld machine gun. He looked at me surprised, saying, Where did you come from? There are a couple of loaded discs, but there is half a disc left, he said. When those who are hiding behind the end carriage come up, hit them hard, and we'll make them lie down and throw them on the dam at once. All right, hmm, answered the machine gunner, not looking at me any more. Tis, as soon as the Germans on the right tried to move forward to cut off our way to the dam, the machine gunner fired a long line at them. The Germans lay down and began to crawl back, firing short bursts of machine gun fire. Three of them remained lying motionless, where the machine gun had mowed them down. At the same time, a group of about ten Germans approached us in short runs. It was headed by a long-legged German, apparently an officer. My neighbor with a sniper rifle immediately killed this German as soon as he raised himself up and, bending down, ran in our direction. The German straightened to his full height, swayed and fell. The rest of the men I striped with three short bursts, having lost an officer and three soldiers. The rest of the group rushed to escape and took cover in the nearest ditch. No, guys, to the dam, I shouted. We rushed with an arrow to where the earth rampart was lost in the darkness. The confusion and bewilderment of the attackers lasted no more than a minute, but we managed to run to the place which was not illuminated by the fire of burning cars, and immediately lay down. Having regained their senses, the Germans opened fire with automatic rifles and machine guns. But for us this fire was not terrible now, because we were in a ditch that ran along the dam. Bullets whistled above us and away from us. We did not return fire to the Germans, and they did not dare to poke around in the darkness. Barely having time to catch our breath, 
we saw the Germans shooting toward the dike and approaching it. They realized that there were no more of us at the roadstead, so they behaved more boldly. They gathered in groups, consulted about something, and pointed towards the dam. We could see the Germans very well, because the whole pass was well illuminated by burning cars. Where we were, the Germans did not know. Most likely, they thought to break away did not stay on the dam. We prepared to cross to the other side, but the Germans decided to sweep the dam with fire. There was nothing left for us but to take the fight. Having taken good positions in hollows and potholes on the dam, we waited for the enemy. Our advantage was that the Germans, illuminated by the fire, were as if in the palm of our hands. They could be targeted, and we were hidden by darkness. I suggested to the fighter with two automatic rifles to give one to the sniper and share the discs, and to all who had grenades to prepare them for battle, in case the Germans went on the attack. As soon as the Nazis came within 70 meters of us, we opened fire. It was so unexpected for the Germans that they immediately rushed back, and having reached the wagons, hid in the bushes where I about an hour ago tried to understand the turmoil going on at the roadstead, as there was no other chance to break away from the Germans. We ran along the dike to the other side of the pond. To the right of the dam we heard machine gun bursts. I realized that over those who were defending there, danger was looming. The Germans could use the dam to get to their rear. I ordered my companions to take up the defense at the end of the dam, and I went to find out which unit was fighting and what its task was. Two hundred meters away from the dam, a machine gun platoon, headed by Junior Lieutenant Borisov, took up the defense. The defense blocked a narrow strip of a hundred meters between the river and the swamp. Borisov was surprised that behind him was a causeway by which the Germans could get to the rear. The platoon got to this bank by the bridge, which was two kilometers below the dike. The machine gunners also knew nothing about the firefight at the roadblock, for they were fighting with the advancing Germans. Mm, come on, Sergeant, take me to this dam. There we need to establish a defense there, or we'll really fall into a trap. Borisov dragged me by the sleeve. We led him to the place where three fighters took the defense. Borisov sent a fighter with a handheld machine gun to help us and asked his men to share discs with him. The machine gunners allocated two full discs for the handheld and a couple of discs per machine gun. Borisov's platoon repelled three more attacks. On the dam was quiet because the Germans apparently did not know what forces we had here and waited for the morning. Looking at a clock with a luminous dial, Borisov told his assistant that the platoon had completed the task. During this time, the battalion has broken away from the enemy at least ten kilometers. Hey, it's time to break claws and us. Avakumov, take off your barrier. Let's go together directly through the swamp. We must use the darkness, said Borisov. The first one, with a pole, went to the left into the swamp. Not even five minutes later, in the place where the platoon held the defense, began frantic shooting from German machine guns and machine guns. We do not know what happened there. Most likely, the Germans attacked the platoon's defense and, failing to detect the enemy, began firing on the sides. But it did not worry us much. We knew that they would not go into the swamp now. And besides, probably, before dawn they would not know in what direction the platoon had gone. In an hour and a half we came to a dry lawn. We thought it was already the coast. But when we looked around we realized that it was only an isle in the swamp and we'll break for twenty minutes. We can smoke, Borisov commanded and fell on his back, spreading his arms. After about five minutes he got up. He ordered to drown the machine gun, which had a punctured casing, and the first and second numbers, freed from this load, ordered to substitute for those who carried the wounded sergeant on a stretch. Then, having verified his location by the stars and compass, the lieutenant again led us through the swamp. It was already beginning to get light. Ahead, a little to the left of the direction we were going, a rooster's singing was heard. We, exhausted by the passage through the swamp, had hope and strength. The platoon, if they can be considered eleven soldiers and us, the four that got out of the disengagement, added a step and as suddenly as a rooster singing, the forest and the swamp broke off. We came to the bank, which went gently upwards, and there we could see buildings and a well. It was a farm or the outskirts of a village. In the pre-dawn twilight it was hard to tell. Arisov ordered me and two fighters to scout where we had gone and where ours were. I took a hand machine gun. The lieutenant suggested me to lie down behind the fence, from where the road leading to the farm was clearly visible. As we managed to see under the scope from here, you can take all the local buildings. The lieutenant and the soldiers came to the well. They wanted to draw water, but there was no tub. 
a woman approached the fence. Why were the chain and the tub in the well removed? Borisov asked. The woman obsequiously replied that the owner had removed everything so that the invaders would not take advantage of it, and now he is not at home. He will return only in the evening. She can't help. Having heard her, the lieutenant swore and waved his hand to the sergeant, who was with the others on the bank of the swamp. The guys, having tied their belts and hooked a kettle to one end, poured water into flasks and drank. The lieutenant sent me to scout where the road from the farm leads. About 500 metres from the well, the road led to a roadway, from which there was a right-angle turn-off, half overgrown with grass. Lieutenant Borisov, after some thought, decided to take this road. I tried to prove to him that our regiment had taken the country road. It was on it that fresh traces of equipment were left. The lieutenant said that the most direct way is the unmade road. All right, you take the country road, and the platoon will take the road. Let's see who will catch up with the regiment first, said Borisov. I went along the highway with three soldiers, whom I met at the roadblock. We got acquainted and learned a lot about each other. Three of my companions turned out to be soldiers of the 1st Platoon of the 6th Company of the 2nd Battalion. The platoon's task was to prevent the Germans from reaching the bridge, to allow the 1st and 2nd Battalions to move away across the dam. Therefore, the same bridge passed and Borisov's platoon, whose task was to defend the strip between the river and the swamp. The regiment passed through the gap relatively quickly. The platoon was to withdraw in half an hour, as the last unit of the regiment will pass the dam. Everything was going as planned. But a group of Hitlerites approached the bridge in cars. The platoon did not let them overcome the bridge by car. Right on the bridge two cars were blown up and burned by grenades, which blocked the way of others. When the fight began, it was still light. The Germans apparently by radio contacted their mortars and quite competently corrected the fire. So already in the first minutes of the battle, the platoon suffered heavy losses and moved away from the bridge to the roadblock. Having obtained watercrafts, the Germans crossed the river and began to advance, pushing the platoon to the place where the wagons were piled up, to afraid of catching their own. The enemy mortars stopped firing, and at that time I came here. We walked slowly along the country road. The night crossing, fatigue and night fight were affecting us young fighters. It seemed that an hour or two and we would be exhausted. We were walking, not observing the caution with which we were approaching the farm. There was an oppressive and soporific silence around. We heard only the crunching of sand under our feet. Suddenly we heard the noise of engines behind us. It seemed to shake us up. I and my comrades rushed to the right, to the edge of the forest, into the dense shrubbery, and we lay down. The noise was getting closer, and about 500 metres away we saw four tanks, our 30 checkers, own, coming out of the forest. We came out of hiding and waved just in case, hoping that the tankers would take us. The first tank stopped, followed by others, and out of the open hatch of the tanker stuck out his waist. From his unbuttoned overalls, one could see his gymnaspia with a single sleeper on the buttonhole. Hmm, comrade captain, take us. Hmm. I addressed him. Teofan infantry, just hold on tight, he said. Having seen our hand machine guns and automatic rifles, he asked if we had ammunition. I answered that we had used up almost all of it in the battle. He complained that they had nothing for the machine guns, but they could share ammunition for the hand machine gun and he gave us a zinc box with ammunition with which we immediately loaded four discs. While we were fiddling with discs, the captain disappeared in the tank and in a few minutes came out with a couple of discs. We'll share this too. We probably won't be able to break through to our own without a fight. Blanks, after a couple of kilometres on the country road, broke out on a straight road and increased speed. In half an hour we were in front of the crossing over a small river. The tank captain climbed half out of the hatch and said, Hmm, I can't understand what kind of river this is. It's not on the map. Then Colonel Tereshenko appeared, accompanied by an infantry captain. He approached the head tank, or turned the tanks to the edge of the forest, camouflaged the vehicles and will cover the crossing. He shouted to the tank captain. I have orders, replied the captain and lowered into the tower, closed the hatch. I gave a wave to the guys, and we fell from the armour like peas. The head car touched down, followed by others. And stop, I'll shoot you. Frantically shouted the colonel, pulling a pistol out of his holster. Then he fired at the armour. The tanks turned abruptly and rushed in a northerly direction. The commander of the tankers on trial, 
Min impotent anger shouted Tereshenko captain, who accompanied him. But he himself realized that he would not do anything with the disobedient captain in this situation. More than a hundred automobiles, many horse-drawn guns and steam-powered wagons were piled up on the shore, and the transports kept coming and coming. From the last arriving vehicles reported that. Germans were approaching. But it was felt that Tereshchenko more feared not this, and the German air raid. Dozens of mangled and smoking cars testify to the results of its strike. Tereshchenko regained his composure and by his actions brought relative order. He created three companies out of scattered lagging from the units, which he united into a battalion. The task of this battalion was to ensure the defense of the crossing. The commander of the battalion was appointed young Major Bereskin. I with my companions got into the second company. It was to keep the defense in the center, that is, opposite the road on which the enemy was moving. In addition, it was necessary to cover the gully, through which the battalion must leave after the end of the crossing. Major Bereskin, having lined up the barrier, set us a combat task. The division was to fortify itself on the hills west of the crossing and hold out for two or three hours until the equipment and the main parts of the division passed the lowland and crossed to the east bank of the river. The units defending the crossing took up their lines and began to dig in immediately. Despite the fact that the defence stretched for a kilometre and a half, Bereskin several times went around it, telling commanders how best to choose a position. From the west came individual vehicles and groups of fighters who had fallen behind their units. Cars were sent to the crossing and the fighters were left to cover, pouring them into the companies that took the defence. Soon our approach stopped. I was appointed commander of the squad, which included Yushakov, Ivonin, Yelkin and Sappers left from the platoon of the neighbouring regiment. Our platoon was commanded by Lieutenant Fedorov. Having seen how the platoon was dug in, Fedorov praised and the ground was sandy, and the squad quickly coped with the task. In about forty minutes we made two short trenches and a couple of nests for hand machine guns and covered the berm with fresh sod. Since we were located on a hill on the left side of the road, Fedorov set the task to break the enemy column. A couple of hours later, from behind the distant heights, came to us the noise of engines. A few minutes later, the combat guard rolled out on the hill. Five motorcyclists rode in a triangle across the width of the road. As they entered the hilltop, the motorcycles stopped. A German sitting in a sidecar on the first motorcycle fired a line at the bushes to the right and in front. In front, two handheld machine guns streaked across the guard. The German who had fired from the sidecar let go of the machine gun, leaned back on the seat and shook his head. The driver rolled to the road and rushed on all fours to the ditch. The motorcycle remained smouldering in place. Others from the combat guard began to turn the vehicles back, but long machine gun bursts of Ivonin and Yushakov did not let the fascists get away. Two motorcycles went up in smoke. Two of them crashed into a ditch. Four Germans were left lying on the road. One rushed to run, it staggered and fell on the road. As soon as the Germans' combat guard fled in panic, another group of motorcyclists came up, followed by several vehicles with infantry. Seeing the wrecked vehicles, fleeing soldiers, the column stopped and threw out flares. From the woods rang out shots of our guns. They directly hit the Germans. Mercedes burst into flames. One car tucked into the ditch, caught fire. The infantrymen jumped out of other vehicles and scattered on the slope of the heights. They crawled back, firing indiscriminately. Not a quarter of an hour later, sighting shells sang over the defences. They burst between the defence line and the crossing. The entire gentle western slope of the heights was strewn with the corpses of German soldiers. But our losses were not insignificant either. Half of the cells were empty. Newly arrived Lieutenant Sabertsev rushed from one flank of the defence to the other, placing soldiers so that there was no gap in the defence line. The Germans were pulling up reserves. The soldiers, watching the edge of the forest, from which the road came out, distinguished in the twilight a large concentration of the enemy, preparing for a decisive attack. Now they will crush us, said Yushakov half-voiced. Oh, I'll crush you myself. Do not panic. Shouted at him from somewhere appeared Sibertsev with a bandaged hand. The commander's eyes were no longer mischievous, but burned with evil fire. Knowing that the soldiers were running out of ammunition, he gave the command to prepare grenades and make in the trenches shovels to fight hand to hand. Behind us we heard the noise of engines. Four light tanks approached the shrubbery. Captain Bereskin ran up to the tankers, talked to their commander and went to our company. 
he set Comrade task at all costs to repel the attack. Hold on as long as possible to ensure the departure of the first and second company, he said. Let's try, hmm. Unhappily muttered Sibertsev. The Germans, having shelled the strip of defence, transferred the fire to the crossing and fiercely beat on it. But where they laid mines and shells, there was no one. The attack began, the Germans went three thick chains in full height, on the move watering the defence with automatic rifles. In the twilight their machine guns did not do us much harm. Our defence met them with rare volleys. Lieutenant Sibertsev sent short bursts of fire at the Germans, between which he hurled the most profane mate, urging the men to give more fire. However, his swearing was of no use. Many of them were out of ammunition, others were killed or wounded. But here tanks came out to meet the Germans and began to cut the enemy with machine guns and hit the chains with guns. The Germans did not expect such a turn, froze for a few seconds and rushed to escape. Specially got to the enemies from the machine operating on the left flank. The tank was crushing the Germans, and the machine gun continuously spewed red lights. Seeing the enemy fleeing in panic, the soldiers in the trenches amicably shouted hurrah, although no one went up in the counterattack. Having driven the Germans into the forest, the tanks turned back. Only one of them was left to burn on the battlefield. At this time, the first and third companies withdrew from the defence, and over the hill went down to the gully. The soldiers carried stretchers with the wounded, supported those who could walk on their own, having weighed on themselves barrels and machines, machine gunners cautiously, in a chain, went down the slope and were lost in the bushes of the gully. Our company remained in position in case of covering the withdrawal, although it was obvious that the Germans would not attack us until morning. Here came our turn. One by one we left our trenches and gathered in the gully, where the last to arrive was Sibertsev. The bandage on his arm was red from seeping blood. This is the second wound in the same arm, but the lieutenant did not pay attention to it. He was more interested in the fate of the company. Something we are not enough. Hmm, he said, flashing angry eyes and led the company girder. Having overcome the swamp and the river, we came to the edge of a large forest. There were five vehicles waiting for us, although three would have sufficed for the rest. The Germans continued to fire at the crossing, not knowing that there was no one there and the barrier had long left the defence. After an hour we caught up with the column, in which were the first and third companies, but until morning could not catch up with the column of the division. Apparently, at some of the many forks we took the wrong road. We drove all night. The road was empty. At dawn passing the fields we saw a small village on the left, located on a hill. Major Bereskin, having consulted with the commanders and deputy commander Nustroyev, decided not to enter this village. According to the assumption of the commanders, the road is about to lead to Vilia, but behind remained kilometres, and the river was still not visible. Major Bereskin, who was riding in the back of our car with the deputy commander, kept looking at the map, fixed on his tablet, and shrugged his shoulders in bewilderment. At last the road was interrupted by a river. It was much wider than we had anticipated. The river was much wider than we had anticipated, and the bridge over it had been thoroughly destroyed. Jumping out of the vehicles, soldiers and commanders rushed to the river. Major Bereskin looked at the piles sticking out of the water, leaning in different directions. The picture before us showed that those who destroyed the bridge did it in such a way that there was no hope of restoring it. Shall we try to make a crossing here? Bereskin said as if to himself. What will we use to fix it? We have no tools and even if we did, it would take a lot of time. And the German is probably on our tail somewhere. Maybe he'll be here in a couple hours. I suggest we burn the cars and go up the bank, ejected Neustrev. It's good for you, but I'm responsible for the safety of the cars. Mereskin stood his ground. Hey, I am as responsible for the safety of the cars and people as you are. In this situation, any other solution is the death of people and machines. Neustrev was... Bereskin surrendered. The scouts sent to find out if there was a suitable place for crossing nearby could not report anything good. They came with the owner of a neighbouring farm who called himself Arturas Duranitis. Bereskin asked the old man to help him find a boat to ferry the wounded to the other side. The owner of the farm offered his boat. He left and in half an hour he appeared. We saw him rowing toward the shore. The boat could take no more than four people. So the old man had to shuttle across Villia more than a dozen times. How far is the German far from the farm? asked Arturas Duranitis. 
if not today, then tomorrow will definitely appear in these places, answered him Bereskin. Oh, oh, it's not good. I know these Germans. You can't expect any good from them, said the old man, somehow waning. Bereskin, digging in his breast pocket, took out a hundred-ruble note. You'd better come back soon, and you'll still need the money. The owner of the farm waved his hands and, having said goodbye to us, went slowly back to his place. It was felt that he was deeply upset by the fact that the Germans might come to his farm. Major Bereskin ordered to set fire to the cars. We stepped aside, watching the burning equipment. When the gas tanks began to burst, we started to go down the banks of the Villager. With the wounded on the other bank was a group led by Major Neustrave. Everyone capable of carrying weapons, except for the Sen instructors and orderlies, stayed with Major Bereskin. At first we saw each other, but those who were with the wounded moved slower than us, and soon we lost sight of Major Neustroyev's group. Our task was to get to the first crossing, get to the other side, and, having waited for Neustroyev with the wounded, move eastward to connect with his or any other unit going inland. All the way we could hear the bursting of bombs, the farther we went, the more they were heard. The soldiers guessed that somewhere ahead there was a battle for the crossing, 